that Indian economy is doing well and Indian markets will continue to do well, I think it's an easy claim now. But 20 years ago, to identify the potential that India and Indian markets could reach where they are was a rarity. And my guest on the show is one of those rare breeds who 20 years ago had identified that. Actually, more than 25 years ago, I had identified that. He's an original thinker. And if there is one interaction everybody really looks forward to, including me, is to understand Ramesh Damani's outlook for the coming year for India and uh, what is the original thinker thinking in terms of mega trends. I mean, the word mega trends before it was coined, Ramesh Damani actually started uh, adapting that in terms of identifying IT, content companies, railways. How can we forget that famous call? So I'm really excited to host him on this year special. What a delight to have you, Nitina. Thank you for joining us. Nikunj, it's always a pleasure to be on with you and thank you so much for the very kind words. And I will say that learn to be bullish in India. I learned from a common friend, Rakesh Jinjunwala, and my mentor, R.K. Damani. They're the ones who taught me that India is a growth country. It's so populated and so... It, the only upside is now, the downside is that the, there is only upside. So I owe a lot of debt to those two people at least. Uh, you know, but to, to be fair, uh, you know, Ramesh, you've always identified mega trends. And before world started using the word mega trends, you started actually practicing the whole thesis of looking at the big picture and then identifying companies within that. Yeah, absolutely right, uh, Nikunj. I try to do that. I think we kind of, when I came back in <clears throat> the late 80s to India and the mega trend was cement shares. It was actually morphed by what was called the liberalization trend that was taking place in India. So after that, I realized the big money is made in the big swing and you need to identify the big swing. So we were very lucky we got the 2000 you know, technology trend right. And then I tried to follow each bull market and try and spot the leadership in this bull market. And I've been at somewhat of a thought process trying to figure out how do I label this bull market that started? You know, how do you label this bull market? And I finally had a, you know, what do you call it, eponymy moment which <laughs> says that the, the label would have caused the growth of the great Indian middle class. I think that's going to be the great story. The new book out, which I'd recommend, I haven't read yet, but I've ordered by Homi Kharas called The Middle Class. And a lot of my ideas are from there. And he says that it's the middle class that started in England in the 18th, 19th century that is shaping our world today. And he says that out of a population of about 8 billion, 4 to 5 billion are now in the middle class. And the maximum number of middle class are coming from people like India rather than even from people, places like America. So that's going to be a major trend because the middle class is, someone defined roughly having a PPP purchasing power parity of about $12 uh, per day, which is significantly above the poverty level of $2 a day, which means at that point they can save, they can invest, educate, travel, do a number of things. And what we are seeing perhaps in India is, you know, the beginning of this hockey stick curve. As a per capita has gone over $2,500, the middle class expanded quite handsomely. And they are now demanding action on things from climate change to travel, to better education, to better living standards. So I think that will be, as you correctly pointed out, the mega trend that is not only shaping this bull market, but also the society around us. Okay. What is right and wrong in this market? We can argue both ways. What is your assessment? Well, you know, I think there's much to be right in this market. I think uh, the last few days we've seen a significant fall in the market. And I think we've added, if I'm not mistaken, about 13 crore DMAT accounts in India, a majority which have come in the last three years. And all of them have been uniformly optimistic, which is good, but they're getting a lesson to understand, uh, exhibit A in the market, the difference between what I call risk and volatility. Risk is the choice of permanent loss of capital, which is very dangerous and you don't want to be in that situation. Volatility is what happened yesterday and what happened the day before yesterday and what will keep on happening in the markets. That market's correct. The next 2,000 points on the census can be up and down. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Maybe an astrologer can say what will happen. But my strong feeling is that the next 20,000 points on the census are higher because uh, of the unfolding demographics, digitization and democracy that has taken root in India. So I feel that uh, there's a lot that's going on right with this market. <coughs> what is going wrong in the market? Always a bull market like this will lead to excesses, will lead to overstretched valuation, will lead to unnecessary confidence, will lead to perhaps sometimes regulatory changes that are important or regulation changes that are important being pushed aside because the market is doing so well. So we hope those mistakes don't happen. But there's a lot to be thankful and a lot to be looking forward to be optimistic over the next few years 
than rather be pessimistic. The hallmark this year has been uh, the smaller you've gone, the better the gains have been. From SME to small cap and mid cap and large cap. Do you think there is a, you need to be careful and watchful in the SME and the small cap space now? Well, you know, the way I look at it is that what was unpopular, what was unloved, what was unacknowledged has done well, which makes classic mm -hmm. sense for a new bull market. You want new leadership. And so it has to come from extreme unpopularity. We've always known that. And that always happens. <clears throat> is there a bubble sort of happening in the SME segment or in the option segment? Probably. I would be very careful in that segment. The kind of volumes that trade place in the option is beyond my understanding. Uh, the kind of froth we see sometimes in the SME market is beyond that. But broadly, a well-managed company, whether it's a small cap or large cap, is still a good investment opportunity and I would remain invested in them. Uh, I would be very careful of the bubble territories, things in, say, the SME or in the option market. But otherwise, I think I'm pretty much okay with the market. How are you approaching this market? Fully invested? Yeah, I'm fully invested. I barely have any cash, which is rare for me. Typically, I go in with 5-10% cash into bull market. But I think as I've aged and matured, I've been more confident of putting all the money in the table and let the risk come uh, where it will. Um, you know, I feel there's you know good reason uh, for optimism. And I, I feel that one of the sectors that I called this time was, of course, the public sector yes. stocks, Nikunj. And they've had a brilliant run out there. And I think we need to give credit to the Modi government. The public sector was one of the dregs on the Indian economy. We all were talked about privatizing this economy. But they've turned this around. If you look at Meet the People in Japan, they're really on top of the game. Uh, for the first time, they're doing an OFS, and the prices go sharply higher after the OFS. You know, So the fall is very temporary in those prices. And I think the debate that police used to have that they should be privatized or value will not be unlocked has now receded. I think we are fine if these companies are so well managed. And I think one thing very important that people missed in the stock market was that A, the government would use these public sector units as the blunt edge for capital expansion, and B, that they were telling them that you have to pay 30% out as dividends. So you go back two, three years, you're getting these companies on today's earnings and be 7 8% yield, which is extraordinary uh, bonanza for investors who got in early. So, you know, I think uh, it's been a good place, and I'm very clear including after all the Prime Minister spread on Parliament. I yes. mean, I'm sure you noticed yes. that. Uh, they basically, you know, uh, the Prime Minister of India going on the floor, the well of Parliament and saying, a bullish case of public sector in stocks. When did that happen? It's never happened. So we were ecstatic when the Prime Minister did that. I think it was in mid-August sometime. Yes. So I think uh, my personal feeling is that uh, uh, the, the leadership, as I keep telling, is very much intact with the public sector stocks. They probably have a large way to go still. Because typically, if you see in the bull market leadership, the stocks go up 10x, 20x after some point. So I would remain invested in good quality businesses. I mean, the market cap of pace, you were looking at uh, the data yesterday. From 2021, <coughs> 2021, the aggregate market cap of pace, use, including you know, LIC and some new IPOs, is up 3x. Mm. That's the aggregate market cap. It's I know, it's, it's been a phenomenal run. And plus, you got so much dividend out of it. I mean, you were getting these stocks basically at 4 or 5% yield. Yeah. And with the certainty of an order book, it's not that the order books were speculative. We knew the order books for the next five years. So, you know, it was, uh, you know, I think there was a whole debate which was, I think, wrongly conceived in the stock market uh, last year was that you buy quality at any price, you know. And of course, that's a misleading. You can't buy quality at any price. You cannot, there's a price that you pay will reduce your investment returns without doubt. And I think the people who stuck to finding value investing and trying to find value in irrespective of the PSU, small cap, large caps, it didn't matter. I think did well. So if you look at you know some of the exchanges, you know, the exchange the major exchange remains stable where the unloved exchanges went up. The FMCG and the private banks didn't do well, the PSU banks did so well. So the market, you know, took note of the cheapness of the that those particular sectors and rewarded those who bet on that sector very handsomely. And I've been lucky in that. Within that, you identified rail, which you've gone on record and you've said that you bought into the railway PSU basket, less of defense and more of railways. Not true. Actually, I put okay. my first bet was on defense and okay. then second was on railways. Okay. So but you bought both. I bought both and I bought both with a lot of, uh, well, I wouldn't say with the, the conviction I have now, but uh, I just felt that they were too cheap. And uh, I, I bought all, in fact, all the defense companies. I think some of them are extraordinary businesses and they continue to do well. And what's happened, Nikunj, is that we've gone from importing a lot of the stuff to making the stuff ourselves. 
and now we're exporting it. Look at the number of orders that, say, a company like Bharat Dynamics is getting or Hindustan Aeronautics is getting. It's extraordinary the shift that has taken place. So I think if you ask me within the PSU sector, where is the leadership? I would say it's in the defense. And you think that uh, one should look at these stocks barring the volatility which could happen 10, 15, 20 percent, nobody knows. But as a leadership sector, you think PSUs as a bracket and within the defense and railways could be subparts? I think so. And I mean, just to point out, there's a lot mm. of poo pieing about the PSUs mm -hmm. over many years. And I just, uh, you know, wish your people who come on the show and, you know, mm -hmm. speak poorly of them. But say a company like Bharat Electronics, mm -hmm. which I own and I'm not recommending in any way or form, other than educating the public about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we bought the stock maybe in the early 2000 at, you know, 300 crores market cap. Mm -hmm. It's one like 30,000 wow. crores right now. The dividends itself are compounded at some 18, 20 percent, something mm -hmm. silly. Mm -hmm. So they've delivered some superior returns and they never dilute the equity. That is the mm -hmm. most important thing I find. They've never diluted the equity in the 30 years they've been listed. They've never diluted the equity. Which Indian companies can you say haven't done that? Even Infosys diluted the equity multiple times. So extraordinary business run extraordinarily well. So I think some of the criticism has been misplaced. I think people who criticize them lumped them all together without trying to do what a stock picker should do or what good value investors do is judge each individual company on its merit. I think they're paying the price for that. Why do you think these things happen? I mean, if the market cap was so cheap, if it was a defense, government-backed business, dividend yield was so strong, the same thing happened to, let's say, PFC, REC. Why do markets ignore them? You know, it's a case of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. A lot of what is called herd mentality. Mm -hmm. I think sometime in the mid-2000, the mantra became very popular in the stock market, quality at any price. We want mm -hmm. good capital allocation. There's some very well-known, mm -hmm. one author I met recently called Pulak Prasad, and I respect him for it. He's done a fabulous job. The book is fantastic. Actually. Yeah, book is fantastic from Darwin, uh, what I learned from Darwin. Mm -hmm. But he made the statement, he said, I'll never invest in the public sector. But then he was honest to say that I want to invest in a MNC also, mm -hmm. because both are very poor capital allocators. Even because, conglomerates. He said, huh? I've never bought Tata's yeah. or Bidlas. So I appreciate yeah. that. At least he had mm -hmm. the intellectual mm -hmm. honesty to say mm -hmm. that I don't want to go to a capital allocator. It's bad. Mm -hmm. MNCs will also not do it in your best interest. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. But most people just want to throw the baby out of the bathwater because, you know, we made a lot of money in the first round of the PA. So we were familiar with these companies. We understood valuations out there. Mm -hmm. And there was a period where you didn't make any money from them. But again, it's come back. So the market has to have the cyclicality and uh, up and down uh, trajectory that goes through. I, you know, I think people who just said, oh, in 2000, I only invest in tech in India, or people said, I only invest in high-quality business, pay the price. The market is not a place for the arrogant. It's a place for the humble. Mm. Uh, so the money in markets, uh, mean reversion is the biggest truism. They always say that. Uh, excesses always get created on the upside, on the downside. Where do you think markets are mispricing growth on the upside, that they are pricing a cherry consensus? And where do you think they are still ignoring the potential of the business or the value of the company? You know, it's a very difficult question. I don't know all that because I'm a stock picker. Mm -hmm. I try to look bottom. Mm -hmm. Having said that, uh, my first question is, would I want to remain fully invested? I, a correction started, maybe it's coming, maybe right on there. I think, yes, I do. I mean, you know, I don't see any signs that I normally would see in a top. We do see some signs, the, the reckless capital expansion, the IPs, the response to public issues, something out there. But for the first time, we're also getting, you know, three crore new investors coming in. Mm -hmm. Every morning the market opens, 1,500 crores is ready waiting to be invested. So that is a sea change that is happening. So some of the tops that we see uh, in the market in terms of over leveraged companies or too much debt or, you know, too shaky corporate earnings, I don't see that yet. So I'm willing to tell you that what we are witnessing now is volatility, and that is the nature of the market. I think Charlie Mungo recently passed away, and this, uh, was asked the same question. He said, in his lifetime of 40, 50 years of being with Berkshire Hathaway, Berkshire Hathaway corrected three times of 50% each, and it didn't matter a whit to him, because he said that's the nature of the market. We can't deal with it. You're not going to make money in life, okay? So volatility is what comes with the market. Risk is what I said is the chance that I can permanently lose capital, that I buy a business that goes bust. There have been a lot of businesses that go and bust. In India also, you, on the 2000, the tech boom, I can rattle up names. I don't want to embarrass the promoters, but the business has gone a lot. So you want to avoid that kind of situation for any, any time in the portfolio. And that can happen even in a good market that the stocks can actually go bust. So you don't want to get into that. A lot of people do option trading, which is a zero-sum game. You probably want to scale down on that because it might be easy money, but when you lose, you can lose almost your entire fortune in that. So I would be very careful of that. But they're very good, high-quality businesses in India, you know, which I told you, whether it was the public sector stocks, the uh, BPO businesses, the IMEC corridors that we're talking about, 
which will generate returns and do well for the customers over many, many years to come. And if you are young in India and you're looking at the next 30 years, you need to invest. I mean, someone asked me what was the best time to invest mm -hmm. in India. I told them, the, in my opinion, the best time to invest was July 24th, 1991, which is the day Manmohan Singh gave the budget. The index was 1400. The census was, believe it or not, 1400 out there. Mm -hmm. And that day, the cards were open. We knew that India was going to change and go to a better place. And subsequent events have proved it completely. The next best time to invest is today. I mean, if you haven't invested in India, you've got to start doing it now. I mean, when are you going to do it? And look at it from a period of 5, 10, 20 year periods. Don't look at it from the next five days, which, as I said, could be extremely volatile and you could lose a lot of money out there. But if you keep the faith by a high quality business with good cash flows, you're going to come out ahead in this business. Okay, I, I'll sound very repetitive with this one, but it's important that we just uh, get your views again for the benefit of our viewers. If you weigh prices and risk and the market dynamics, sliver of the market may be expensive, which always is the case, but by and large, you think the market is in a good, if you do a health checkup, the diagnosis of the market, you don't think there is a bubble or there is a mania in the market. One should Ab remain fully invested. Absolutely not. I mean, you know, I, I, I you know. <laughs> I'm asking in point blank. Yeah, I mean, point blank. And, you know, I, I know mm -hmm. I can be wrong with these mm -hmm. kind of things. You don't know, it's, you know, markets are, you know, live forward, but understood backwards. So mm -hmm. you do that. But all my predisposition tells me remain invested. Mm -hmm. Don't get scared by the volatility. Uh, and I haven't been for 30 years. I've always remained almost fully invested in Indian markets. Mm -hmm. So don't get scared with the volatility. Mm -hmm. The best is yet to come. I think, uh, you know, maybe India can't double in three years, maybe double in four years' time. But, you know, it's still, you know, the best place for a young Indian to be. I'm not a young Indian anymore. I'm reaching senior citizen level. But for a young Indian, you're 30, 35 years starting out, where are you going to put the money? I mean, mm -hmm. you can't put it in gold or cryptocurrency. It's a duds game to do it. Mm -hmm. It's a mugs game, in my opinion, to do it. You need to put in equity, which generates some returns for you, gives you some dividend, and allows you to build your wealth, just like my generation built the wealth. As I mm -hmm. told you, in 1991, when we started, the index mm -hmm. was 1,500. Mm -hmm. It's closer to 75,000 now. Look at the journey that's taking place. You made 30, 40x on the index. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you pick stocks, how well you must have done during that period. So I think, uh, given and given the sweet spot that India is in, in terms of its democracy, in terms of its demographics, in terms of digitization that is helping, and the growing middle class in India, you know, there's a growing middle class, maybe 500 million people will be in the Indian middle class in the next by 2030. Extraordinary development taking place and we're going to witness what a lot of economists call the J-serve yeah. curve. Once yeah. India's economy per capita goes over $2,500, $3,000 per cap. And in that there'll be wide dispersion of people earning 10,000, 15,000, you know, mm -hmm. the average is 3,000. But there are a lot of people above that number and that's going to power growth for a number of years to come. Demographically, as you know, we are the best positioned country in the world. I think China's population is projected to go over the next 30, 40, 50 years, maybe from 1.4 billion to 800 million. That's the kind of demographic disaster Korea, Japan, Italy, China are facing. India's population is still growing and still young. So the next 20, 30 years, we don't have a problem. Okay. So I'm just going to borrow the term which you just coined, the middle class bull market or the middle Indian income bull market. What is the best way to participate in that? Because if I look at that aspirational India, which is young and under 25, they will travel more, they will consume better products, the value curve will move towards premiumization. So should one really build an aspirational portfolio of what Indian middle class will consume and just sit tight on it for the next five, seven years? Well, again, it's always a reference to a price. I don't think, I think someone pointed out that uh, one of the best consumer companies in India, Levi, hasn't given a return for two uh, years, years or three four years. years actually, it's probably given you, you know, flattish returns for three, four years. Before that, it went up 10x. So, you know, it depends on the price. The price is, I pay a lot of importance to the price, mm -hmm. Nikunj, because, uh, you know, to me, it's... Uh, if you ask me what I think of a company, the first question I'll always ask is, what is the market cap of the company? Because I want to evaluate how the market is valuing that business, you know. So I, I would pay a lot of attention to the price, but these are sweet spots that you need to be invested in, you know, depending on, again, the availability of price or whatever. Like I have kept Lieber, for example, in my portfolio over 25 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, though it hasn't performed for three years, it doesn't bother me a bit. Mm -hmm. Because I know that the compounding over 25 years will be okay. It may not be over three years or so. I want to keep participating in those kind of businesses. So I'm happy to do that. But we move our assets around in other stocks in the meantime, you know, sometimes in the public sector, sometimes in the KPO business, sometimes in the China plus one strategy, sometimes in the IMECC, because where we find value. So in a portfolio construct, you obviously want, as you say, those Indian names that you feel that 
you want to own for the next 10, 20 years, but may not give you returns for the next one or two. But you also want to own the stars of tomorrow, which you feel the businesses that will do well. So I think if trade goes well, this businesses that support the IMEC corridor will do very well. When you say China plus one, there are again uh, zillions of ways in which you can play. Literally zillions of ways now. There is EMS, there is chemical manufacturing, even textile as a sector is coming back. What to your mind is your best way to bet on China plus one? We found two companies. I mean, as you say, there are many ways to skin the cat. So I'm not saying I know all the ways to skin the cat. But I feel there's a definite movement towards, amazingly enough, mm -hmm. I mean, you grew up with China, China, China for the yes. first time, you're now here in India and China is going to the background and China is actually destroying wealth mm -hmm. uh, by its fight against entrepreneurs and capitalism and India is promoting mm -hmm. entrepreneurs and capitalism, which is great. Uh, we found an auto ancillary company, which uh, uh, in Gujarat, which is on the edge of globalization. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, thing, the kind of cash flow the company has been able to generate and also the uh, global opportunity because people want a manufacturing base in India. So that opportunity will come over the next two, three years. You will just sit and watch that place. So that seems like a good place out there. There's a small uh, engineering company we found in Indore of all places, you know, which seems uh, to be, again, benefiting from climate change, benefiting from, you know, nearshoring to India. So, I mean, there are lots of ways you can probably find a place. But as you correctly pointed out earlier, that this is a theme that you want to latch on to. You know, it could be in drugs, it could be in chemicals, it could be in engineering, it could be in services, I'm not sure. But you want to see things that, oh, the global market will move from China to India. I think that's inevitable because they cannot trust one supplier, which is a communist and in an adversarial position anymore. So you want to move it to India. But having said that, India's tech service or BPO will continue to outperform dramatically because the cost of real estate is so cheap in India, labor is so cheap, you cannot find labor in America at even $15, $20 an hour. So you're getting cheap out here. So the BPO space in particular mm -hmm. will probably do very well. Have you put your mind to what uh, could be the AI disruptive impact on the traditional IT services model? You know, I'm pondering my head around it, which is very hard to grasp what it will be. I mean, if you listen to what Bill Gates say and a few other people say, it is pretty, yeah. uh, it's a train coming down you. Uh, but I have not been able to fully discount it yet or fully uh, be conversant with what happened to my tech stocks. Will the employment shrink because yeah. AI will do the code for these people? Or, you know, will it expand because there will be more need for people to do this? I am not really sure yet. I have my basic tech investments still in place. I haven't moved them around much. But what the impact of AI is going to be is something that maybe in the next five, ten years will be clear, is not clear to me right now. You know, purists would always say that we would buy pure IT. 2000 top four IT companies were TCS, Infosys, Wipro, HCL Tech. 2023, they're still the top four companies. But where you, hunt, where you like to fish, you like to typically fish in the billion to a $2 billion pond, and you've been shopping there. So within those niche IT companies, whether it is product or whether it is SaaS, where are you shopping? Well, I did. I got a few of them wrong, to be honest with you. There's mm -hmm. one product company in cybersecurity that we were very bullish upon. Mm -hmm. That didn't work out. I mean, to be honest, that, uh, you know, we bought at the top, sold at the bottom. Now it's mm -hmm. come back all the way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we got out of it at a loss. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to be honest and perfectly candid, it's a tough business, as I've told you, it's very humbling. And I think since 2000, I was very enamored to find a product-based company out of India, you know. And that was in cybersecurity was all the more helpful to me. But he just couldn't scale up the business and he could not address the global market. So, you know, it didn't work out. So, you know, it's, it remains a very humbling place. I mean, I'm not uh, by any means saying that. And I think, thankfully, after 2000, even I broadened my search out to include a few other companies in the mm -hmm. consumer sector, like we got McDowell's or whatever else, mm -hmm. and now in the public sector units. So I think it helps to keep an open mind and look for value mm -hmm. and not say that I'm only going to find value in tech. And that is what Charlie Munger used to say, that if you are you know, like a man with a hammer, he's going to think everything is a nail. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. I want to, you know, 60 years uh, mm -hmm. plus in life have taught me to be flexible and to think of values in different ways. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, hopefully each bull market has matured me and, you know, I'm no longer stuck in the ways I was in 2000. You know, we've always focused on what, what are, uh, what is... A smart investor buying. We never focus on how do they, when do they sell and why do they sell. So the decision of buying can be templated with a model, it could be templated with a theorem, it could be templated with varieties of uh, you know, thought process that you have. But the decision to sell I think is the difficult one. So the decision to sell, how do you arrive at that and what's your process? Well, you know, I've actually 
also try to graduate myself over the last 30 years or so. Uh, you know, I would start with, you know, if you, all the stupid things that we do in the last year, double your money, sell it, you know, you get half for free and all that. Is you don't do all that now. I, I, I've grown up. Mm -hmm. I don't do all that. You know, that used to be, you know, self-defeating. Mm -hmm. Once I had infos, I realized the stock cannot go up double, can triple, can go up 10x, 100x, mm -hmm. 200x. You know, why would you want to sell it just because it's double? It's a pretty silly idea and then look for a new business out there. So I learned that very early on in life. I didn't want to do that and I hold out there. And increasingly in, my, in the continuum of learning, I've tried to come, in, try to be a clone as much as possible to a Buffett, mm -hmm. uh, Munger theory that you want to invest in the permanence company, you know, want to invest in businesses that will, uh, you know, last, you know, maybe a few generations. Nothing lasts for more. I mean, the history of business teaches us that in a 300-year continuum, every business goes failure. I mean, Munga often talks about Kodak, you know. Yes. You could go to any emerging market, see a Kodak or a Coke sign, and Kodak is no longer in business. Not that photography has died down. Photography is exported 100-fold, but Kodak died down on that. So being humble about that businesses don't last beyond that, but maybe it can last 30, 50 years out there. So a large part of the portfolio is try to structure out there. But to answer your question more specifically, when do you sell out there? This is what I found, that if you find a superior investment opportunity, you sell. Uh, that makes logical sense to me. Whether it's superior or not, that's a very difficult question for you to decide, but that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that I found that works and which I will also try and implement in this bull run, first, all bull markets end badly because you know that. There's no yes, bull yes. market that's a soft landing and you know everything mm -hmm. continues out there. Stocks will be down 30, 50, 70% from that mm -hmm. peak mm -hmm. price whenever that happens mm -hmm. out there. So when do you think, and there's some signs that come across that a bull market is ending, that's the time you want to get into cash mm -hmm. because you feel they're very extreme. I mean, that happens maybe three, four times in your lifetime. But, you know, when it gets that, you don't want to remain invested because you know the market is going to fall 40, 50 mm percent. -hmm. It happened in 92, it happened in 2008. So there are periods when there are red flags waving at you that this market cannot sustain itself, it's overpriced. At that time, you probably wanted to get cash and sell. Other than that, you just ride it. My answer to people saying that, oh, my stock's down 20%, I didn't sell, I wish I had done. This is what I tell young people to do. I say that you have a 30-year career ahead of you, all right? So don't look at your career in one individual stock could be down 20% or up 15%. I don't know that. But overall, has your portfolio value doubled every three years? Mm -hmm. If it has doubled every three years, you're doing a good job. It's an aggregate. So yes. it'll be stocks that you didn't sell the peak are down 20% or some stocks mm -hmm. that are still climbing up, you know? But broadly, given the India's growth rate, inflation rate, that's about 23-24% compounded. The Sensex over long periods give you 16%. You add another couple of points for dividend, you know. Mm -hmm. You're not crossing that big a hurdle to get to 23-24%. But if you manage to double your money every three years, you're doing the right thing. Don't worry. Whatever strategy you're doing is good. Mm -hmm. The idea that you can get the tops of a stock or bottoms is as well said for fools and liars. It doesn't really happen. Mm -hmm. But And good businesses take time. You know, sometimes they'll go to two, three periods of consolidation before they move the next leg up. And you just have to learn to deal with it. That is what market has taught us that. You know, when you buy something, you're not buying a stock or a squiggly movement on a chart or a price, but you're buying a part of a business. And you need to keep that business until the fundamentals of the business have changed. Are there any stocks you've been holding on for more than 25 years in your portfolio? Quite a few, Nikunj. I mean, I think Sundaram Finance would be one of them. Lever, maybe for 20 years or so. I, I forget, but, uh, you know, I'm in the happy state that, you know, I let it compound and I think I have a younger son who's more anxious, mm -hmm. he's not performing. Uh, I try to calm him down. I said, look, this is the test. I'm using. My, my portfolio doubling every three years. Broadly, if I'm doing, that, I'm doing the right job, I don't really care what's happening in, individually within a component of stock. And that's what's been happening broadly because India has given us that kind of opportunity. I'm not saying I've been a great stock picker, but I've been blessed because I've been in the right macro environment. Was that your initial approach also, double your portfolio every three years, whatever you get on top of that is a bonus? Should that be the approach also now for everybody? It, it definitely should be the approach. Was it my approach at the beginning? No, it, mm -hmm. I came upon it after a long mm -hmm. uh, period of thought and looking at how other people behave and mm -hmm. what kind of compound you can do out there. But it's magical. I mean, mm -hmm. if you can double your portfolio every three years, mm -hmm. over a period of 30 years, mm -hmm. your index, your wealth will go up 1,000x. You do the math, it's actually amazing. Compound interest is not poorly, not incorrectly said as the eighth wonder of the world. It's actually one of the more amazing things in life. Human mind thinks linearly and we don't think in a log scale and compound works in a log scale. So yes, I would strongly, strongly recommend people do that because it's a way to financial freedom. If you can do that, you're home.
remember your uh, you know one of your comments which has stayed with me that a bull market can actually course your financial it does life, which because it's does. so obvious it does it changes yeah. the course of your portfolio the course yeah. of the country it's like an eclipse it's a miracle of uh, modern finance and when this bull market started in 2021 mm -hmm. or when COVID, you know how badly hit yeah. we were and what we were thinking about ourselves and our portfolio out there and already two two years three years into this is completely transformed our outlook uh, the feeling of a country the feeling of wealth outlook as me as a person has changed so it is actually one of the more honest statements i made in my life that no one understands what's happened uh, once a bull market starts and once where it ends a couple of last follow-up questions. I'll, I'll, I'll shamelessly extend my appointment with you for another five, seven minutes. Sure. What has changed between when you started versus now is the pace and speed of communication. Uh, you know, the outcry system became DMAT and DMAT trading has moved to mobile phone and God knows where it is moving now. Because information is freely available and information is widely discussed. How has that changed the cycles and how has this changed the awareness and psychology of an investor? You know, people say that, but I think, you know, more information is available. That doesn't mean they say more information is absorbed. I mean, you know, people just still follow herd mentality. Mm -hmm. So I think people who have insight or can curate are still to be valued and to thought about. Original thinkers are still to be valued and thought about. You know, people, you know, what is that famous song that people uh, looking without seeing and yeah. people, you know, hearing without listening, whatever. So I think that's still true in the market. You know, the follow-up to that question is that people say that the opportunities are more plentiful mm -hmm. 40 years ago than they are today. And I find both to be wrong because, you know, you look at last 10 years in America, the most dissected, discerning market in the world out there. You had companies like NVIDIA, you had companies like Apple, you, had, you know, which Apple doubled the money of Buffett bought a few years back. 2014, I think. Yeah, about so many companies mm -hmm. uh, have discovered, which are 10-baggers, you know, Meta, mm -hmm. Facebook, which are well known and the business still grow up 5x, 10x. So how can you say that the opportunities are less? Opportunities are great. I think one of the beliefs of capitalism is that over the next 10 years, the kind of technology that are shaping our world will provide more opportunities, not less opportunities. So I remain quite optimistic about the future. Has it changed? Yeah, it's probably changed. I have more access to information. Getting a balance sheet was harder in my time. It's much easier now. It has changed, but that's still insight that is required to pick a great stock and the conviction required to hold a business it's still fairly a rare commodity, and I don't think that's going to change. I think we will keep swinging between, you know, fear and, you know, optimism, and people who can take advantage of that will probably do well. Yeah, I remember one of our common friends said that in 1980s, if you knew the share capital of a company, you'd done your research. Yeah. That was the level of information which was available. <laughs> Pretty much, it was that hard. You got a balance sheet, you know, someone gave me the balance sheet of a company, and I made 100x money on that just because I happened to get the balance, balance sheet at the right time. Yeah. That's all. It was so hard to get the data that time. You a lot of advice which is well appreciated by audience who's between 25 and 35 but there's also an audience my age nearing 50 nearing 60 at 60 what would they don't have 40 years of visibility in their life what should they do you know it's uh, i mean i can i'll start with myself then i'll try and broaden it out i'm you know on the wrong side of 60s you know so i'm closer to 70 than i am to 60 mm -hmm. now so you know mm -hmm. take that I am 99% invested in the Indian stock market. Now and I know about equities into equities, pretty equity. But how much know, of your wealth is in equities? Percentage? 100%. I mean, the rest doesn't count. Okay. I mean, it actually wow. is irrelevant to me. The house, the jewelry, whatever we might have. Actually, I never count that. My asset pro, allocation is 90% plus equities. Let me put it this way. <laughs> it will be closer to 95%. Oh, wow. Believe me. <laughs> but it's you know, to me, I I know I understand it. I mean, I mm -hmm. you know, I can deal with it. Even if it goes down 20%, I can deal with it. So. I'm perhaps a special breed. I don't want to put my thing on other people out there uh, because we are creatures of the market. We put all our money in the market. I don't have any FD, any cash, and you know, real estate is only to live with, basically, mm -hmm. never to invest. So it's worked out pretty fine for me. It's worked out pretty fine for me. If you're old and not in the market, you know you, you need to put in some cash because you're entering the age, and particularly markets fall into a swing 30%. What are you going to do? So, you know, I, do, I don't know the right advice to do, but I can always tell the right advice for a young person. I'm very clear about that. There's no hemming, hawing, mm -hmm. delaying it. Remain fully invested. Ride out the tide. Ride out the volatility. Risk is of permanent loss of capital. I don't see the situation happening in well-matched companies. It can happen in bad, bad companies. So do that. But if you're 50, 60, yes, you need to be a bit more careful. I mean, I'm not the rest example because I am 
basically from the market. So I understand the risk. Okay. But if you are 55, 60, yes, you need to get into a little bit of FDs, you know, take advantage of some Last ideas. but one question, I'll flip it completely. Uh, last time when we spoke, I spoke to you about uh, a father giving advice to his son. We spoke about what advice you've given to your son. Go to lovely grandchildren, touch wood. Yes, we are an Anna. <laughs> I got a shout out to them. You told them that grandpa's coming on TV? <laughs> no, I haven't, but I make sure I leave my digital trail every time with them. I absolutely, you know, I'm ridiculously happy being a grandfather. Touch wood, touch wood, touch wood. But I'm sure as a grandfather, you're also doing what would be called as creating a nest egg for your grandchildren. And that is what could be the grandpapa's gift. How are you creating a next egg for your grandchildren? They've got 50, 60 years ahead of them. Absolutely. And I've realized the value of starting early. I mean, the compounding versus magic started early. And, you know, I'll give you an example and bring it back to my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. You know, Buffett bought Coke mm -hmm. in 1989, 90, I think. And after he bought it, he made 10x money. Then for 15 years, the stock didn't move. Mm. It hit $45 and 15 years it remained between $30 and $45. For 15 years, the greatest stock pick in the world mm -hmm. did not sell Coke. It always boggled my mind that mm -hmm. for 15 years, the stock doesn't give you a return. He didn't sell it. So I tried to investigate why he didn't sell it. And they realized that the dividends that he was getting was, you know, a large percentage of his returns. You know, he was getting, I think, 15, currently he's getting about 60%. He put a billion dollars into mm -hmm. Coke in 1989, a billion dollars, 25% of Berkshire's net worth into credit. And it went up 10x and then didn't appreciate. But he was getting $600 million a year back as dividends. Okay, So wow. the cash flow from the investment was always there. Mm -hmm. So the longevity of that investment is made up by dividends and by capital appreciation. So I'm trying to do the same thing for my young children, mm -hmm. uh, grandchildren actually. They're starting early, putting in business that I think will last 10, 20 years uh, out there. So maybe a real estate business because we're always going to need real estate maybe some accessories business because human beings will always want an adornment with themselves. Business that I can see for 10 for 20 years and given my son straight instructions not to be sold. These are to be kept for my grandchildren, you know. So, you know, I think I can't recommend it highly enough. If you're young uh, and you have children who are below 5 or 10 years or your grandchildren, as in my case, open a DMAT account and start investing for them. Your money will get clubbed with them in the capital gains. Mm -hmm. But try and buy stocks for 10, 20 years and remember that until you sell it, there's no tax consequences. Yes, so the yes. money can grow unimpeded, compounding mm. over long mm. periods of time. And even if you compound every five years, you double your money or four years, you double your money. Mm. They'll have a pretty good nest egg by the time they reach 25, 30. Uh, how does your day start? How does your day end? Let's talk about it before we end this interview. Uh -huh. Well, you know, I think uh, my day starts like a normal day. I mean, I'm mm. in desk by 9.50, 9.30 still. I really enjoy it, even though I'm closer to retirement age. I really mm. still... I'm in love with the job I do, so you know I, I just enjoy being in the office and you know, looking at stocks and mentoring a lot of young people who come to my office. I have a whole bunch of them coming later today to meet me, so it's always fun out there. In the evening, it's you know uh, I used to go to CCI and hang out with my crowd. Increasingly, I'm spending time with my grandchildren because uh, you know they you know it's just lovely to see these young children grow up and you know the kind of questions they ask you and how they probe you. So uh, I do that. I used to read a lot more Nikunj. I'm sorry to say I don't read that much anymore because my eyesight has become a bit weaker mm -hmm. and I enjoy a bit more of Netflix, I think, than I should. Podcast, uh, maybe? Uh, yeah, podcast, Netflix, Next time, let's plan YouTube. <laughs> Absolutely, Nikunj. So, you know, a bit more of the, uh, this thing, though, uh, there still burns a regret within me that, you know, we've been so inspired, Nikunj, I think, as mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. covering Indian market for 30 years mm -hmm. and I have been a participant mm -hmm. of the stories of Rakesh Njumala and Nimesh Bhai, Rakesh. Uh, R.K. Damani and all that they've accomplished in their life. And while you, theoretically you've done okay for yourself, mm -hmm. you realize that you must measure yourself against the best in yes. the business, you know. Yes. And the best in the business, I realize I have a long way to go. And, you know, I, they really truly serve to inspire me even today to try and do my best. So the best of the money is yet to come. I, I, I hope so, though I'm entering what they call the, if not the winter of my life, at least the fall of my life. So we'll, we'll see where I go. There's nothing, I'm very happy. I lived a great life. I have two ridiculously happy grandchildren. So I'm, I'm very thrilled with the way life's turned out. But I think like most people realize that could we have done better? We probably could have done better. Well, Buffett's made 90% of his wealth or 96% of his wealth after he turned 60. So keeps me up. Day. Keeps me up. <laughs> Absolutely. If I get that, I'll be very happy. I appreciate it. I'm so nice of you to join us and best wishes for our lovely year ahead. 
always nice to be on with you, Nikunj. Happy New Year to you and Happy New Year to all your team at ET and all your investors. Thank you very much. With that, it's back to the studio.